Hey, thanks for being a part of the conversation. Let's do some pod crashing. Episode number 262 is with Danielle Morton from the podcast City of Rails. Oh, I got to tell you why I love this podcast, because as a child, and I don't, I think it's because there was a, a, a railroad uh, farmland, basically, in, in where I grew up in Billings, Montana, I wanted to be a hobo. And, and, and you really put the life and style into this to help me understand what really goes on in the chapters of being on that train. Oh, you know, I, the romance of the rails is, I think, part of American culture. You know, when you see that train, you often think, oh, what if I was on that train? Yes. What if I could just like, walk out the door and say goodbye to everything that bothers me and worries me and just like throw it all up to fate, you know? And I don't, I, I think every American is kind of like, get me out of here at some point. <laughs> and I think that's what motivates. Like, I really appreciate what you just said. Also, Montana, such a rail culture there. Oh, my God. You know, did, I don't know if you listen to episode three, but... Um, Cece Ryder, this grand old lady of the rails, lives right next to the tracks in Haver, Montana, and she's got a hell of a story. Haver, my God, I mean, that, that's it's so cold up there. What, how, who, what kind of a hobo would live, net, or somebody like that, like Cece Ryder, would live that in in that area of the world? Well, you know, um, these are all members of this railroad gangs. There yeah. were a lot of railroad gangs in the '90s. Not so much today. Not as powerful, certainly. And uh, they mostly have gotten off the rails because they're in their 60s. And, you know, being a hobo for 20, 30 years is a hard on the body. Yeah. So she saved money. And I don't know how she did it because it's not a very lucrative life. Um, but she wanted to be near a crew change. Now, a crew change is a place where the crews change, right? You know, they come in and they at the end of their shift and another crew takes over the train. Because that's then that she could get to the other people that she used to travel with who were also living on the crew chain. So it was like part of the, it's part of this hobo network that still exists. So that's why she ended up in Haver, Montana. We're, we're going to go pretty deep into this with, with, with Haver and with, with that, uh, that area where so many hobos have, have gathered and things. And I have to ask you, because I know the history of, of Haver in the way that it, it is a meth capital of the world. Did you see more drugs, drug abuse there than any other place? You know, I didn't see when I went to visit her, I wasn't really I didn't see that much drug abuse. I would say most of the people that I met um, who travel the rails are um, alcoholics. Yep. There are a lot of alcohol, a lot of like binge drinkings. And so when they're like panhandling, they're panhandling just to get a handle at the like the Tiger Mart that's going to cost them $14. Um, and then everybody gets to share it, you know, because it's sort of a collective culture. There is a lot of heroin on the rails. Mm -hmm. Um I mean, a lot, a lot of that. I didn't see so much meth, although I know it exists. One of the things about about this, the, the 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 adventure or the love for it, is the fact that when you'd be sitting at a a a, a railroad stop and you'd see a hobo sitting in a car, and it was like they always looked free. Did you did you pick up on that when you when you were with them? That that it's like their 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 souls were like, no, I'm not. I don't want to go anywhere, but where this train is taking me. Right. Um. You know, when they sit on the edge of the train yard they scrutinize the trains because if you're experienced you can tell where a train is going by what cargo it carries oh. so like if you're in the pacific northwest and you see that there's a car full of lumber it's pretty good guess that it's going to end up in the bay area san francisco off to china because we export eight billion dollars a year of lumber from our forests to china right so if you're trying to figure out i want to get you know to oakland that's my train. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so there's this, then there's also this thing, which I've got a copy of called the crew change, the same, you know, thing that we were talking about before, which is this insider's guide to the rails that is made by hobos. They have a listserv where they say, okay, this yard has changed. They built a bridge over here. You can't get into this access point, which allows you to like scrutinize the train yard and know where to stand to get the train that's going in the direction that you want to go. So there's a connection, there's a web of communication between these hobos that wasn't possible with the hobos in the 30s because now everybody's got cell phones. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you did you take a long time for you to learn how to jump on to the train? Because you know how Hollywood is. Hollywood makes it look like the train's going five or six miles per hour and you have to run beside on the gravel and then and then you jump on. It Does it, does it really play out like that? You know, most people don't want to hop on a moving train oh, because that's incredibly dangerous. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have in episode uh, four, which is about all how you hop a train. 
Yes, I humiliate myself with my attempt to hop a train <laughs> and I'm not able to do it. Um, I don't have the courage. Uh, I don't have the physical strength. Because if you're going to get on the, what, the scene that you're talking about, the Hollywood scene, mm-hmm. so what you have to do is you lay in the bushes alongside the train and you wait for it to start to move. Because you don't want to get on a stationary train. You want a train that's leaving because a train could be sitting there for hours, days in some cases. So if you've figured out what train you want, you wait until it starts to move. But you have to go at the right moment because there's bolts on the side of the wheels and they call this the blur. And if the bolts are going so fast that you can't see the individual tops of them, then it's going too fast for you to jump off. Mm. So what you do is you run alongside the train, you throw your pack and your dog in many cases up onto the into the boxcar. And then you grip the side of the boxcar with your hands and hoist yourself up. So the guy who describes this in episode three of City of the Rails is um, six foot one and very athletic, you know, in his 20s. I'm, I'm none, of, none of those things. Um, and when you hoist yourself up, you have to do it with great confidence because if you don't make that move correctly, it's like a gymnastics move. You slip back under the boxcar and that's how you lose your legs. Mm, mm. We're yeah, tra- most of the people go, oh, so go ahead, sorry. <laughs> No, we're, we're talking about Mike, right? I mean, because, I mean, the, the, the way that Mike opens up, you first of all, the way that you open up this podcast is the greatest, greatest cliffhanger because you, with, with, with Mike being introduced in episode one, I know that we're going for a ride here, but I just don't know where we're going until you get to the next episode. Well, thank you. You know, I mean, I thank you for acknowledging that because when I started looking into this world, I had no idea where I was going either. I didn't know where it was going to lead me. I mean, all I knew was I had a sense of urgency. My daughter had disappeared onto the rails. And what was the choice that she made? Why did she decide to do that? What was she going to be getting out of it? Because the normal response would be, you know, she's rejecting me. That's what a mother always thinks. It has something to do with me, you know. But she wasn't running away she was running to an actual world that has its own sense of value and justice. And that's why I called it the city of the rails, because it's not just the hobos that are part of this world. It's also the workers, you know, the engineers and the conductors and the people who work on the in the yard. When you once you start, once you touch the rails, they sort of change you, you know, and there's a way in which your life is forever altered by this interaction with the trains. Because it's, it's the romance of the rails. But it's also the brutal nature of these big beasts of the train and throwing your body up against that train (laughs) on a daily basis. It it changes you, you know. So, yes, you know, it was it was a search for her. But at a certain point, it becomes also an absolute fascination with me, because here is this world that we see every day. We see the trains all the time. and We have no idea what's going on right inside one one of the things that I that I love about this is the fact that I was very shocked and surprised that the hobos understand the history of the train, and I I could sit and talk with those with with stories like that over and over again. I agree with you. I was a history major, and one of the things I you know was I couldn't constantly be looking for my daughter. There's a lot of dead ends in the journey there, but I read all these history books, and so many th- so much of our world is shaped by. The rails. Mm-hmm. There's historians say that a country becomes modern when it gets its first railroad. Like if you don't have a railroad, you haven't really come into the 20th century from back then, right? And um, it's also about all the things that the railroads gave us that we don't even know. Like railroads created time zones. Railroads oh. are responsible for Sprint, which was Southern Pacific Railroad internal telephony. They later be, lay fiber optic cables along the tracks and then sell those cables to become a cell phone company. Oh, my God. <laughs> they also invented all of the political corruption. That, not all of it. I'm sure there's a big corruption before the rails. But a lot of the mechanisms of, of political corruption were invented by the rails, including lobbying. So after the Civil War, the railroads were booming. They were the high tech of their time. Like the language was exactly like they say high tech. More railroad will bring the country closer together. People who are enemies will become friends because we can communicate face to face instead of at a great distance. We all know how that works out. But um, so all of these guys descended on on Washington, D.C. to get the massive subsidies that were available to the railroads because, you know, the government was giving them free land and like, you know, backing their financing. But so where would they hang out to try to nab the congressman 
in the lobby of the Willard Hotel, which is where all the congressmen stayed, or in the lobby of Congress. So hence, lobbyists. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, then, <laughs> so then time zones. So, you know, this is pre-trains. You know, you look up in the sky and you go, hey, it's noon. Well, that doesn't work if the train is coming east to west. Right. Right. You know, it's not going to be noon in New York at the same time that it's noon in Oklahoma. So they had to have a way of calibrating it so the trains didn't smash into each other. So they divided the world up into time zones. And we've been living on railroad time ever since. I can't imagine what your journals look like, because when you hear stories like this and you really start sitting down to, you know, to, to say, oh, my God, this is very real. This is not somebody's fantasy or the way somebody has bent history. I mean, you're, you're, you're listening to it as, as it has you know, shaped our lives. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's quite a um, surprise, you know, to see because I, I before I started this, I didn't really think anything about trains. Right. Did, most people don't. You know, they're just kind of this analog technology that we ignore. We had no I had no idea that they were in the 1860s, like as powerful and as important and as controversial as tech as high tech is now. Mm. When you entered Colton, California, it gets real. And I, I suggest that listeners, really, they, they've got to start with episode number one. Do not start at episode number five. You, you've got to go the entire journey because I think I get emotionally involved with Colton because because of the fact that you've, you if they don't start at one, they're missing out on a lot. No, oh, thank you. Well, they're missing out on my daughter's departure. Right. Which creates the impetus for me to to look into this world, you know. Yeah. So, so as as a ghostwriter, where did you decide in this podcast that you were not going to ghostwrite? In other words, in other words, you could have easily called yourself something else, you know, did, you know, played out this role of this person that went out there. But no, you've put your uh, authentic identity on this project. Um, you know, when I'm working with somebody else, I the job of a ghostwriter is to essentially disappear into somebody else mm -hmm. and to make sure that you um accurately portray the life experience that they have and also to believe them, to believe that um, what they're telling is a true story from their perspective. And I think in a certain way that prepared me for the journey into the rails, because in a way I also disappeared. There's a lot of like maternal concern because of course it's very dangerous. And my, I felt like I was in a race against time. The world is so dangerous that the longer she was out there, the big, bigger the chance was that she'd never make it back. You know, and so that was my motivation. But in another sense, I was curious about her. I mean, here was this person who had lived with me her entire life. And yet she did this without me understanding that this is what she was going to do. You know, without having no anticipation that this was her choice. So what was the choice that she made? And why did she make that choice? Why would anybody choose this life? And what kind of values does it have? What kind of community is created there? What are the relationships between the people? So in some senses, all this journalistic and ghostwriting training prepared me for this. Do you find yourself wanting to go to another level in the way of, okay, now that I've, I've, I've really gotten deep into the rails, I want to go see what the lifestyle of a carny is, or I want to go see why are people drawn to become roadies for concerts? It, you know, because you're still running, you're still a part of that, of, of, you know, you know, bringing people together in areas, but then tonight we got to go, we got to go. You know, um, you're really very astute in the way you ask questions. You really, you're like almost like a psychic because, um, I have always been interested in outsiders, you know, because, I mean, I used to work for People magazine and mm. I know the world of celebrity and the world of movie stars and all the, the rules and the strictures that um, control that world. But I've always been much more interesting, interested in the people who say, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Why? And how they exist and how they maintain a sense of self, having stepped away from the conventional ideas of what we should be. I would love to do a whole series on carnies. I think they are the most interesting people. In fact, we get uh, phone calls from listeners. We put a number up at the end of the um, podcast to say, hey, if you want to, you know, if you have anything to say, if you think we got something wrong. What, I got a carny call the other day because he was like, you know, I didn't, I always wanted to hop trains, but 
I didn't do that. I became a carny. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the same thing. <laughs> oh yeah, there, there's such a romance there too. I mean, you know, I mean, because I mean, you get to see the world. I mean, I, I always joke around and tell people if you want to see the world, go to, go into radio. You, you you'll be all over this country within a year, and and because yeah. you, you just, just jump from city to city to city. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So then what happens to your writing self now? Because I know as a podcaster, once that becomes your voice, that writer on the inside of you must sit back in its own little corner going, am I next? Am I next? You know, um, there's going to be there's going to be a season two that is going to be 100 percent different. It's still in the rails. 100 percent different about another story that I uncovered while I was doing. This. Nice. And um, I think it's going to shock people when that comes out. And there's going to be a hell of a cliffhanger at the end of this episode 10. But I think people are going to go, so you, what? <laughs> <laughs> so you do believe in continuation get- because you, you, you've you got to be like water. You've got to be able to flow. And whatever, if, if you flow right, the other things come to you. And, and, and that seems to be the type of personality you are. Well, I, you know, I, I followed my daughter into the train yard, you know, and, and there I found a world that was so surprising and so beyond anything I'd ever experienced, you know, in the, in the way that we live in the, conv- I mean, I was a striver. I always wanted to get the better book, the better assignment, another place to write. Mm-hmm. And here is a world where none of that matters. The only thing that matters is your relationship to one another. Are you decent? Do you say what you're supposed, you know, do you do what you say? You know, are you dependable in these dire circumstances? So it's a life stripped bear, you know, and I just find that so interesting. The way that you present this story, it, it does it in a way that really uh, inspires a darker side of my personality in the way that that I believe that the geniuses of this world are the hobos, are the people of homelessness, because if something ever goes wrong with this nation, I'm going to them to teach me how to survive. They know how to survive. Yes, they do. And they know how to form a kind of bond, because one thing that you see in the previous episodes, besides the one that comes out today, I'm so glad you like the one about Colton, um, is that the way you survive is by having a crew of people that you absolutely depend on, that you know have your back no matter what in these dire circumstances. And, you know, a lot of us don't really have that. We have these sort of superficial relationships and we're going to run our own Mm -hmm. show, be independent in our homes. But these people are completely interdependent with one another. And that's an incredible bond. Did you meet anybody else? In in other words, you met him in one city and then maybe a year later you met him in another city. And it's like, oh, my God, where have you been on your journey? Well, Mo, it was like, um, you know, first I went to Roseville, which is kind of near where I live in California. It's only an uh, hour away. And I had peop- I had uh, engineers and conductors show me around the yard, take me into the yard so that I could understand the way the dangers that anybody who was trying to hop a train would face. That's classic journalism, you know. <laughs> and then um, and then I beca- everybody kept telling me in the episode that you just listened to that the capital city for hobos was Colton, California, which is this dusty little town 50 miles east of Los Angeles. So I thought, I'm going to go to Colton. I want to see the capital city for hobos. So I just kept following that sort of journalistic um, feeling of like, that's where the story is next. This is where the story is next. And everywhere I met, I went, I met the most fascinating people. Yep. You're going to meet more of the people from Colton um, in the episodes to come because every train yard has so many characters and so many stories. I mean, you could plop me down in whatever train yard is closest to you. And I would have a story that would be worthy of a whole podcast episode in about two days. I, I would, that's how fascinating they are. I, I would love for you to come to Spencer, North Carolina, which is the Transportation Museum, and and just just to watch you walk through that that area of history. I because I, I just oh my god, just to hear this and then to be in Spencer is just it, 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 they connect in ways that I, I just think that the average person needs to know. I think that people's lives will be richer if they understand the relationship of the rails to the way that we live today. I think that, you know, because I don't I I used to just like, oh, the train goes past and I don't I don't care. It's just an annoyance. How long is that train going to keep going past? Because trains are really long now. They used to be about a mile long and now they're running three mile long trains. And so you're sitting there and you're like, oh, that train, let's get out of here. And you don't have no idea 
Like who's on that train? Who's on that freight train? Where are they hiding? Because there's all these places to hide, right? And then how are they going to get off? And then when they get off, where are they going to go? So these are the questions, like how do they pick the train, right? I mean, these are the questions that I really were driving me because <laughs> it's such an interesting world in that he's like, as soon as I answered a question, I had like nine more, you know? <laughs> and then trainers have personalities and certain trains have names, you know, that they're like, there's the juice train that goes through Florida, you know, every day filled with orange juice. Everybody knows, every real experienced train hopper, you know, the, the names of the trains, you know, and where they're going to go. And you can sit at the edge of the train yard and figure out, well, then take that train. That's kind of interesting to me. I'm so jealous. You got to come back to the show anytime in the future. The door is always oh, going to be open for you. Talk about this. <laughs> when, we get, when we get to the end of the show and the and the big reveal comes about what episode two is about, I think we should talk again. Let's do I love it. Talking to you. you ask a really good question. Thank you so much. Well, we're gonna we're gonna make it a date then. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, you. Okay. You, and oh, and I'm so glad that we're gonna. I'm speaking to people where you are because there's a huge train culture there. There is. Oh yes, there is. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the other thing about this I love is that it's brought me to parts of America that most people don't see. And once again, I'm jealous of you. <laughs> <laughs> you. You Thank be you so br- much. You be brilliant today. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.